you take your Bibles and open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I really do encourage you, I know I do this every week almost, but to be following along in your devotional books. Uh, There are many things that I am just not able to cover on Sunday morning. And some of my hard part is when I prepare a sermon is to find out what part I'm not going to speak about because I want to speak on all of it, but just to keep things moving along. That's why I put the devotional books out so you can be studying it for yourself throughout the week. I did see there was still one on the back table. Uh, If those run out, they're always on the church website, lakeshorefellowshipchurch.org. As well as if you're ever going on a Sunday, I try to get the sermons recorded and on the website by sometime in the late afternoon on Sunday. And you can always watch the sermon. Sermon handouts are there as well. But I do encourage you, if the books run out and you want a physical copy, uh, you can always give me a call and I will print one out and run one out to you. Um, and uh, I'd love to have you just continue to follow along and read together Uh, The word as we prepare to study, as you read on your own, as we study the word of God together. Have you ever had anybody question you about maybe your position in life or to say, well, when are you going to or uh, what about this in your life? I think several years ago when uh, after we had our fourth child and it had been probably three or four years And my wife and I decided that four was kind of a good number for us. Originally, when we got married, we were thinking five. Uh, She had five in her family. I had five in mine. We thought five was a good number. But we always joked to say we couldn't outdo Brooklyn. She was our fourth. And uh, once we reached perfection, we just couldn't get any any further, right? Uh, we, We decided that four was kind of God's number for us. And it was interesting, though, because I remember about three or four years after we we had uh, Brooklyn. I was at a, uh, a gathering with a gentleman who basically, I think he has like eight or nine kids. And he's like, when are you going to have more? And I said, I don't think so. Oh, come on. You need to have more kids, you know, and just it's kind of going, you know what, that's for you, but this is not necessarily for us. Maybe you've been in that situation. Maybe you've been Uh, um, in a spot where people are asking you these things that you really either God has not allowed or God has chosen maybe to do different for you in your life. Well, we're going to look at kind of one of these scenarios that take place in the Corinthian church and the challenge that Paul gives for us to understand as believers is that God has a different call for each one of us And to learn, one, to be content with that calling, and number two, not to try to pressure other people who have a different calling than we do. One of these practical issues that Paul dealt with, we see in Roman numeral number one, is that God uses both married and single people. Sometimes our society gets the idea that unless you're married, or I've seen this even in the church, unless you're married, you really can't be used by God, or if you don't get married, or even the fact is maybe you've been divorced, well, you're just kind of a lesser person because marriage is kind of where it's at, or the ultimate, or you have to find that life's mate. But Paul kind of gives the opposite view, understanding that not everybody is meant to be married. At the same time, not everybody is meant to be single. And we see, letter A, that God has called some people to be married. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now Paul starts out by saying, basically, look, I'm answering a question. They sent a question to Paul to say, is it better to be married or better to be single? Paul starts out, and we see in this passage, there's a few times, and Paul clarifies that he's giving his opinion about things. 
And Paul says, at the beginning, says, it's good to be single. But then he also says, in verse 2, it's also good to be married. Now, Paul is coming from the perspective of he has been given the gift of celibacy, the gift of being single, where he sees the idea of being married as a hindrance to the ministry he was called to. Now, if you've studied or looked at the book of Acts, you see that Paul was constantly traveling, constantly moving around, constantly getting beat up and thrown in prison and kicked out of places, which obviously would not be good if he was married at the time because it would be really tough to do what he did and to be married. So Paul is saying, you know what, it's good not to touch a woman. Basically saying it's good not to be married. But he also understands that God has given some people uh, and many people a natural desire to be married, a natural desire for intimate relationships. And in order to avoid temptations and sin, by all means, get married. Now understand, he's writing to a sex-crazy society. No, it's not our society, though our society is that. It's the Corinthian society, very similar to our society today. We're basically saying, look, one of the reasons for marriage is for sexual intimacy. And he understands that and says, it's good to be single and it's also good to be married. Verse 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, the husband is not likewise, or, as the, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Basically, he's saying one of the main reasons for marriage is for sexual intimacy, for couples to get together, to draw them closer to each other. Verse 5, do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He basically says if you are in a marriage relationship, that sexual intimacy should be an actual part, uh, a, a big part of this relationship as both husband and wife work together on their marriage. Now, if we were in a marriage conference, we would go into more detail about this, but I understand we have a, such a broad scope here. I'm just describing what Paul has to say. And say he's saying it's good to be single. It's also be good to be married. Some people have the gift of being single. Other people, God has given that strong natural desire to have sex. And so, therefore, what he says is get married because that's where God has designed it to be, not outside of marriage, but inside of a marriage relationship. But just as God has called some people to be married, we also see that God has called some people to be single. Now as a concession, verse 6, not a command. Paul's saying this is not a command from God, but this is kind of my opinion, Paul says. Verse 7, I wish that all of you were like myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Paul says, look, I wish everybody were like me. I wish everybody lived a single life like me. Now, he knows that not everybody can do that. He knows that that wouldn't be good for the church if everybody was single. That's not how God has designed many people. He says, as each person has his own gift. God has given people different gifts to be used in a different way. And by the way, I really want to point this out because I have seen, especially in the Christian community, that when somebody is single, people spend their whole time trying to hook that person up with somebody else. Understand that that doesn't mean they're lonely or empty or not complete. Because they're single, because some people, God has gifted them that, and they can be used. Paul says, look, I wish you were single like me. Because Paul is looking to see all the things I can do. Well, we do this in life. When we love a situation, for instance, I would kind of be the other way. I love being married. And so I'm like, man, you got to get married. It's great. It's a wonderful thing. But that's because I'm coming from this perspective. We often try to talk people into doing things that we like 
nothing wrong with giving advice or giving opinion on certain things, but the reality is just because we like it doesn't mean that somebody else is going to like it or they're called or have that ability. In fact, I think there's sometimes people are called to be single, but because of pressure from parents, pressure of society, pressure from other people, they get married to people they shouldn't get married to, and all of a sudden they have kind of a big mess, and some of it is because they were pressured into it. And Paul says, look, it's okay to be single. It's okay to be married, both of them. God has a different calling for each one. And that's what he wants to emphasize for all of us, whether it's singleness or marriage or many other things. He broadens it up here in a minute. As he describes that we're all called to different things. Verse 8. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it's good for them to remain single, as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Paul, again, is coming from this per perspective. He's a single man that really God has given him the gift of celibacy. He doesn't have a strong sexual desire. But he understands other people do. And he says, by all means, please get married. Now, what he's trying to say is some people are single and have this great desire pressure. They feel they have to get married. There's other people who are married and don't like it and think if I was single, life would be so much better we get this idea that the grass is always greener or better on the other side. And sometimes people put all this pressure on us to do one thing or the other. And Paul's saying, look, accept other people in the condition they've got us placed in him. Accept yourself in that condition. Contentment is so important, but contentment is not settling with misery. Contentment is actually trusting God in the place he has placed you in. He continues on in verses 10 through 16. And again, this is a passage I'm just going to skip over. It talks about divorce and remarriage. It talks about believers and unbelievers and those situations. Some practical things that, again, I encourage you to read on your own. He continues this thought here, though, in verse 17 describing that we need to live as we're called. Verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to them and to which God has called him. This is my rule in the churches. Notice what he says. Let each person lead the life that God has assigned him to. He just got done talking about single, married, divorced, uh, unbeliever living with a believer. He's talked about all these situations and says, look, God has placed you in that situation. Choose to live in that situation and be content. Now, there's always this struggle that goes on when we talk about the idea of contentment. Because the idea of contentment isn't just to say, well, that's just the way I am. That's just the way how it's going to be. That's not really necessarily contentment. Contentment is, is I'm going to live in obedience to God. I'm going to live continually growing in God, but content in where he has placed me, content in where he has pushed me, put me in life. So it's not saying I'm not going to quit trying. That's not contentment. They just say, well, I'm not going to try to make it better. So, so if you are in a marriage that is struggling, learning to be content in your marriage doesn't say, well, I'm just going to give up working on my marriage and just be content. But sometimes we have to choose that, you know what, I don't like this situation as much, but I'm going to choose to realize that God put me in this situation. I maybe made some bad choices, but God has allowed me to be here. I'm going to find my contentment here, and I'm going to continually work in myself to make it better. But not the idea that i got to get out of it. Sometimes we get the idea that if we don't like our situation, the first step is I just got to get out of it. I got to get out of it. Get out of it. Where scripture many times talks about learning to deal with the situation because God wants to use us where we're at. 
So he says, if you're single, don't have this desire so much that I got to find somebody, I got to find somebody, I got to find somebody. If you're married, it's not like, oh, I don't like my marriage, so I got to get out of it. Or if you're divorced, it's not to say that, and he talks about the idea of I'm not going to have to go back into a marriage or I don't have to remain single. And he talks about that and he gives a lot of qualifications in that in the verses kind of we uh, put over between 12 and 16. We should see, we see that we should not seek to change our circumstances. Now again, I'm not talking about trying to continually work on ourselves to become more mature believers. But ultimately, many times people are driven to change everything on the outside. Where Paul is challenging us to let our insides be changed. Verse 18. Was anyone at the time of his calling already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his calling uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Now, this is not a big deal for us in our society whatsoever. But in that society, it was a big deal because the Gentiles were not circumcised and the Jews were. And many Jews thought the Gentiles should be circumcised, but then many Gentiles had the idea to say, well, you know, you know, you should be like us. And the Jews are like, well, you should be like us. And Paul says, look, however you were saved, what you were saved out of, continue in, not the sin, but you can continue in that way. Practical example to help you understand this. Maybe a little bit more in our day and age because we don't deal with the circumcision. Several years ago, we went on a missions trip to Micronesia, which is an island in the Pacific. One of the biggest problems they struggled with in the island of Micronesia was an external religion. You see what happened is missionaries came in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, and as they came to the island, what they tried to do is they wanted to convert the people to Christianity But instead of converting them from the inside out and letting Jesus Christ make the change, what they did is they created a Christian culture where basically these natives are having to now dress like the uh, European Christians. So Christianity then focused on the outside, and even today as the missionary was in there trying to share the gospel, one of the biggest hindrances is there's many people who are religious. And it's all an outward religion. They don't know Jesus Christ from the heart. Because what the missionary has basically said, well, if you get saved and, and trust Jesus, that means you, you have to cut your hair and have to put these different clothes on and do this, and you have to look like this. I often call it a cook, cookie-cutter Christianity, a mold. This is what a Christian looks like, and it's a set mold. He says, look, if you were a Gentile and you were saved, you don't have to become a non-Gentile. You don't have to become something different. God has saved you in that for a reason. And this is what I want you to see is that when you become a believer, God doesn't say, okay, you need to move to a different neighborhood or you need to move to a different thing. Many times God has called you to be where you're at in order to be a witness and testimony for him in that situation. And Paul says, look, don't strive to get out of where you're at. Christianity is not about changing everything on the outside. I remember growing up, our church had a thing uh, against tattoos. Tattoos were evil and of the devil and all this all this thing that I, I, I can't really prove biblically. In the Old Testament, it talks about some tattoos, but that's just it's Old Testament teaching. And so it was like a big sin to get a tattoo. And so if somebody got saved and they had a tattoo, it was almost like the church was forcing them to do whatever they could to get rid of that tattoo or to scribble it out or to change it or do something different. And it became, it was all this focus on this outside or, or what I'd hear examples of, you know, this, this person came into church and they had a longer hair and, and they had a beard and then they got saved and the next week they were clean shaven and they had their hair cut like that was what a good Christian did. It's like, wait a minute, this is just preaching that everything on the outside, if I change everything on the outside, that's a good Christian. 
But Paul is like, look, the Christianity is not from the outside. It comes from the heart when Jesus Christ comes in and changes you on the inside. All that other stuff doesn't matter. Verse 19. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. In that illustration, I would say long hair doesn't count for anything. Short hair doesn't count for it. It's all the externals. But keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Now, again, he's not saying, look, if you were called as a believer and you were living a life of adultery, that you should remain in adultery. That's not the condition he's talking about. It is the other externals. He's not talking about direct sin. Scripture says we need to remove direct sin, but the other things in our life that we have, the external things we're part of, it's not seeking to move those things. Not only the circumstances, but it's similar to that letter B, is we should not seek to change our situation in life. So not just the outsides, but where God has placed us. Verse 21. Were you born a bondservant? When called, do not be concerned about it. He says, look, if you were called to be a believer and you are a slave. Now, today, again, we don't deal with this as much because we're not we don't have the slave master society. But he says, look, if you were called and you were a slave, don't try to get out from being a slave. He does say at the end of verse 21, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of that opportunity. If there's something you can do, for instance, a practical thing. You're working a job. And there's a focus in this job and it's a company that's maybe not a godly company and different things. It's not direct sin, but just not a godly company. And you get saved and you become a believer. It doesn't mean that you have to leave that company because they're a, a company that's operated by the world. Well, everything, most everything is operated by the world. It's not saying we have to leave that. If we have an opportunity to get out for a different job or something, nothing wrong with that. But it shouldn't be this focus like, well, now that I'm a believer, I can't do anything that the unbelievers do. No, because God maybe has kept you in there to be an example and a testimony to unbelievers. Verse 22, for he who is called is the Lord as Uh, called in the Lord as a bondservant, as a freed man. Likewise, who was free when he was called as a bondservant? Paul says, look, if you were a slave when you were called, understand that's really not who you are because before God you are free in Christ. If you were a free person when you were called, understand that you are actually a slave to Christ. Those are just out external things, your job, your position in life. You don't have to escape that to be a follower of Christ. Because the follower of Christ comes from the inside. What he's saying is one outward situation is not necessarily better than another. I've met so many people thinking, if I can just change my situation, life would be so much better. If I could just change this or change that or change all these outward things. If I could just have a different husband, if I could have a different wife, if I didn't have to worry about this or didn't have this. Paul says those aren't things to change. What needs to change is your attitude and your heart before God understanding this is God's plan. This is where God's called me. This is where God's placed me. I'm going to be content and I'm going to find the joy in what Christ has called me to. And let her see, we should not be slaves to the ideas of others. Verse 23, for you were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each of you is called, let him remain with God. What he's basically saying is don't let the pressure of everybody else control how you live. Or when somebody else says you have to do this or not have to do this, he says you were bought with Jesus Christ. You're not a bondservant of man. You are a brother in Christ. Let God direct your life. 
So if I were to ask you this question, what does a Christian look like? It's kind of a tough one to define. We'd often kind of like look at the externals first. But really, Scripture kind of makes it real simple. A Christian is somebody who loves God and loves others. You know what that means? That is very, very broad. That's a broad aspect of loving God and loving others. It just, it goes in so many different things. So that means we are very flexible and we are very free to have our own um, kind of personalities. Is that battery dying? The court should be in there. Yeah, I forgot to plug that in. And so to understand that, you know what, because somebody practices Christianity different than the way you do. If they follow God's command, which he says, they love God and they love others, that is what God desires. So much what I've seen in organized Christianity is trying to control somebody else's behavior, somebody else's look, somebody else's thing about them, rather than to understand, you know what, my desire for you is I want you to follow God's command, follow his word, to love him, to love others. That gives a broad scope. So that may, means if a church wants to operate different than our church, so be it. They don't have to do the same thing we do. Our way is not right. Their way is not right. We have different personalities, different things that reach different people. God doesn't want us to be forced into this Christian mold where everybody's exactly the same. He's called us all differently to reach out to different people in different ways. He goes on in the rest of chapter 7 to talk about the principles of, of being a widow and remarriage. And again, I encourage you to read those on your own. As we're moving into chapter 8, he talks about the idea of eating food offered to idols. And we see from this that we should use our spiritual maturity to serve God and serve others. Let me explain a little bit what was going on in that society today because we don't deal with this exact thing. And I don't even know if I can have an exact parallel that we deal with. But here's in that society. There were temples everywhere to false gods. If you would go over to these cities, for instance, if you would go over to Corinth and go down the streets in Corinth, uh, my wife and I had the opportunity about 10 years ago to be in Corinth and they would show you this is where the, this temple to this God was. And the temple of this God was here. And the temple of this God was here. And they had all these temples. That was part of their society. And in their society, what they would do is they would bring their offerings, which was often food, uh, whether grain or meat or drink, and they would bring that to the temple and give that as a sacrifice. The temple would then take and then then either operate a market themselves or they would then resell it to people who operated markets and they would resell that food. So here's the question that Paul had is can I eat food that at one time was offered to idols? Is that sin? Is that like me becoming an idol worshiper if I eat food that was offered to an idol? So that's the situation that Paul is addressing, and then we're going to try to practically apply that to principles in our life because there's a lot of them, not a direct correlation, but very similar to that. First thing we see, letter A, is that our way is not always the right way. Maybe you'll disagree with that because maybe you think your way is the right way, but in reality, our way is not always the right way. There's a lot of times there is no one right way. Several years ago when I started doing some construction work or help with construction, I, my, I didn't grow up doing any construction at all. Um, I, I never, my dad, I remember one time my dad uh, built some things in the house and I was pretty young and I watched him. That, that was all I had. So when my wife and I decided about seven years into our marriage to buy a fixer upper house, I knew nothing of what I was supposed to do or how it was supposed to do. One thing I found was that I talked with different contractors, and they all gave me different advice and told me how to do things different ways. 
And I was like, well, how does this work? Shouldn't there just be one way? But there's not. And yet there's several different ways, and most of them get the job done. And one person swears that this is the best way to put in a window, and you have to do this. And the other person, you don't need to do all that. If you just do this, and you, you know, it's all different in how it works. And, you know, we have to understand that even in Christianity, our way or our opinion is not always the right one. Paul addresses this first. He addresses this attitude before anything. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Now concerning the food offered to idols, we know that if you have a newer translation, this is in quotes, he says all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds. What he's dealing with, first of all, is by putting that in quotes or basically saying, look, all of you possess knowledge. That basically means all of you have an opinion about something. So I realize that every one of you has an opinion and every one of you thinks your opinion is right. And yours is the right way to go. And he says what's happening is your knowledge, what youth call knowledge, well, mine's the truth. You ever heard that? Well, my opinion is the truth. Yours is just your opinion. Well, no, it's your truth because it's made, it, truth is not, truth is the word of God. That's the absolute truth. Everything else are often the opinions of somebody's uh, direction, how they view things. He says, what you're doing is your opinion is puffing you up. It's causing you to become prideful and think that your thoughts are better than others. Verse 2, if anyone imagines that he knows something, if anybody thinks he's an expert or has this because his opinion's right, he does not know yet as he ought to know. He's not very smart, Paul says. But verse 3, if anyone loves God, he is known by God. People who are so adamant about their opinion are often not as smart as they realize they are. Paul says, look, the ones who know God and understand God and under his wo understand his words and how they react, those are the ones who are truly wise. I think in a practical sense. I, I've said this before, but my wife and I minister pastors. And as we've talked with pastors over this last year, they say one of the major problems that they've dealt with is different opinions in the church when it comes to masks and vaccinations. That everybody has their opinion, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's the thing to realize. One person has a thought that's better than the other, but to realize that there's no one right way. Oh, well, this has to be this way, and I'm not going to go to this church here if they make us do this or don't make us do that. Well, I'm not going if we have this. And there's these arguments that happen because of this. I thank the Lord that we've avoided that here is that people come and, and have different opinions on these things, which is, is nothing wrong with that. We have different thoughts coming at this, but we can still come together and worship the Lord, though we have completely differing opinions on these things. And he says, look, if you have an opinion and it's causing division, if it's not something that is scripturally based, 100% scripture says, and I don't know anywhere that scripture says you can't wear masks or you have to wear masks. It doesn't address it one bit. Scripture does not address vaccinations one bit. So therefore, I can't tell you which way is right and which way is wrong because scripture doesn't say it. I can look at medical things, but yet you're going to look at some medical opinion and give me your opinion based on that medical opinion. I can look at one the opposite, and we can argue and we can have all this stuff, and it circles around and it causes division in the church, and it's divided many churches and many people, many have left churches, and it's one of these situations Paul says, look, the truth is the Word of God, and the Word of God doesn't address it. It should be just a minor thing on the side that we choose to live one another and get along with one another. And he says what happens is knowledge puffs up. But here's the key. Love builds up in verse 1. Love is about uniting and meeting together and overlooking these things that we maybe disagree about and understanding that our opinion is not always right. Or basically, maybe we can have two opposite opinions, and we can both be right, but right in our own way. 
But to understand this, our spiritual growth helps us determine what's important. The more we grow in the Lord, the more we realize what's really important. Now, I understand and I'm not putting down the idea of uh, the idea of vaccinations, the idea of masks, they're very important in certain s- in settings and for people. And other people think they're not as important. And I'm not putting that. I don't have the answers to that. But what I do know, it's what's really important is your spiritual growth, your walk with God. Because all those other things are in just on the outside. The unity we have together, that's what's important. Verse 4. He says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. Paul says, okay, let's look at the matter when it comes down to food offered to idols. We realize that though they call these idols, all they are are cement structures. That's it. They they have no power. They have no strength. I understand as a mature believer that these things, these physical things, these idols have no impact. They're not gods. Verse 5, for although there may be so-called idols in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods or many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things are for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Paul says, in my spiritual maturity, I understand that these are just outward objects because we only have one God. So really, if food is offered to idols, it really doesn't matter because they're not real anyways. At the same time, he helps them understand That our actions should be controlled by a love for others. So often we get in arguments about what we think might be right or what we might think might be wrong. And Paul says, you know what, those are going to be your opinions and you're probably not going to convince the other person uh, uh, of anything opposite. But here's how you should choose to act. Verse 7. However... Not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now understand when the scripture uses the term weak, it's not a bad thing. Most of us view the word weak. If I were to say weak, is weak a good word or bad word, we would think it's a bad word. Because the idea of, well, we don't want to be weak. Nobody wants to be weak. Weak is a negative thing. I think a better term probably would be sensitive. Now, I'll be honest, I hate that term as well. Here's here's why I hate that term. When I was a kid, if I ever got called to meet with a teacher or the principal's office, I would go and I would sit there and when I was waiting to go in the office or meet with that teacher, I would sit there saying, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. As soon as I would sit in front of that principal, I would start tears down my eyes. I hate the fact that I'm crying. Oh, that's so wonderful. You're just sensitive. I'm not sensitive. I hate that word. I hate that term, that understanding. But here's the better idea. It is. There's something good about this. He said there are some people who this thing will affect more than others. There's some people who were saved out of idol worship. And they're sensitive that if they ate that meat, they would bring themselves back to those days of idol worship, and they could fall back into the idol worship because they were so sensitive to that. It bothered them where others, Paul, like, I could eat, it doesn't bother me, but this person might fall back into sin. It might affect them. Verse uh, 8, food will not commend us to God. We are no better off if we eat or if we don't eat. He's basically saying food doesn't make us a more spiritual person. So we're not a more spiritual person if we don't eat food offered to idols or if we do. We could apply that to so many things today. We're not a more spiritual person if we do this out thing or don't do this outward thing. But, verse 9, 
Take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. For if anyone sees that you have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, he will not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Now again, I like in our terminology, it would probably be better to use sensitive here. As he says, look, if you have a person who's very sensitive about this issue, which it's, it's very easy for them to be tempted into sin, and you are not facing this temptation, and they see you do it, and they think, well, since you do it, it's okay if I do it, and they fall into sin, basically he says, you are responsible for that brother's sin. Now this was a really hard thing for me to understand when I first realized it, that there are some things that might be sin for me that might not be sin for you. Now, let's take a moment. I'm not saying the idea of adultery. Adultery is sin for everybody. But there are certain things that because God has convicted me about these things or certain situations that I know are not good for me and I know God doesn't want me to be a part where somebody else doesn't have that same conviction, if it's not directly listed in the Bible, that may be right for you and not right for me. Verse 12, Thus sinning against your brother... And wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes a brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Here's simply what Paul is saying. If my actions cause somebody else to sin, I don't care how righteous it is, that I can say it is, or how there's nothing wrong with it, whatever. If it's going to cause somebody else to sin, I'm not going to do it. Now, understand this is not meant to be a controlling factor. I've known people that have taken this verse and try to control the behavior of others to say, oh, well, what you're doing is, is offending me. I've heard that. Well, you offend me by that, so you shouldn't do it. Several years ago, we were at a volleyball tournament, I, a soccer and volleyball tournament. I was the soccer coach, and I think my wife was the volleyball coach at that time. And, and uh, it was a state championship game and, or a state tournament, and, and I went with my soccer team after our game, and we were cheering the volleyball players on. And we were jumping up and down and having a good time every time we'd score a point, and we would cheer, and we would do all these things. And, and afterwards, I had somebody else come to me and said, I didn't like the way you were cheering. Uh, that offended me. And basically, he was trying to control, and I said, you know what? I want my young people to see that following Christ is fun. You can have a great time, enjoy yourself, and still be a follower of Christ. I don't want to be in this situation where I'm offending you. I didn't offend him. I didn't cause him to sin. It just bothered him. He didn't like how we were cheering because he didn't, whatever, for whatever reason. It's not the verse about offending. It's not to be used to control somebody to say, well, you offend me, so you shouldn't do that. That's not at all what Paul says. He says, if I, as the mature believer, see that some of my actions might cause another believer to sin, and I know it can do that, that I'm going to kind of stay away from that. I mean, a practical example that I've seen is I know some people that have been saved out of, uh, they were an alcoholic, and then they came to know Christ, and they were a strong alcoholic, and God delivered them from that. They have a pretty strong stance on he, they don't think we should drink any alcohol. I know other believers who drink alcohol that really don't have any problems with it and don't see anything with it and use it as a social thing. And for me, if I'm going to be around somebody um, in a situation or somebody says, well, I know that that's going to offend or hurt that person or cause them to fall back into that, when I am with them, I'm going to abstain from that is what a believer should do. Because then there's a big argument, well, should I or should I not? And all these arguments of whether we should or shouldn't, and it often is on all about the externals. But ultimately, Paul says, anything, if I do something and it's going to cause my brother to fall or to sin or to hurt them, I'm going to stay away from it. Now, that doesn't mean we can live our whole life thinking, I mean, everything I could do, 
maybe could offend somebody or bother somebody. That means we can't live our whole life wondering, oh, is this going to offend somebody? Is this going to bother somebody? Is this going to hurt somebody? And kind of overly conscious about it. But knowing that this situation would be a harm to somebody else, I'm going to choose, Paul says, to love that other person. Now, you could apply this to so many areas, and I don't think Paul meant to be overly picky on this, but he basically says the overlying theme is love. I'm going to choose my actions that aren't directed directly by the Word of God by is this thing going to cause somebody else to fall? Is it going to cause somebody else to Do I know it's causing somebody else to sin? If it is, I don't want to do it. And in that situation, it was for some people. So therefore, he says, look, I would rather avoid that thing, even though I have every right to do it. I know it's going to hurt that person. Now, does that mean he couldn't do that in his own home? No. Or if he was in a different society or a different place or a different culture or a different city? No, because it wasn't right or wrong. Behavior was controlled by, is it going to cause somebody else to? to fall and to sin? Is it going to hurt another believer? In conclusion, I want you to ask yourself these questions. First, do you realize God wants to use you in a situation he has called you in? Paul says don't seek for everything else to get out of whatever you're in. Choose to embrace the situation God has placed you in, to be content and to shine as a light in your situation. And that's the second question. Are you content with your position in life? Not that you're not trying to make yourself more mature spiritually by studying God and let God make you more mature, but are you saying, look, God, this is how you made me. This is the situation you placed me in. And I'm going to choose to embrace it. I'm going to find joy in it. I'm going to choose to love where you've placed me in. And then lastly, are you using your spiritual maturity to love others? Sometimes we grow in our knowledge and we think, well, I know what's right. I know what's best. You've got to do this and this. Paul says, look, I'm willing to give up whatever it is if it's going to hurt another believer. Before we sing our final song, I want you to take just a moment to bow your head and close your eyes. Let God speak to your heart and mind this morning.